Hello, I'm Dominic Cobson, co-founder of Future of Finance. Central bank digital currencies, CBDCs, are one of the most far-reaching and radical changes in the universe of fintech, and one of the most fast-moving too. Just this week here in London, the UK Treasury and the Bank of England have set up a task force to design a sterling CBDC. My guest today is Simon Chantry, Chief Business Development Officer at BIT, the fintech company he helped to found in 2012, and which helped the ECCB develop Dcash, the world's first retail CBDC. Simon, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Dominic. Always a pleasure to be with you and the future of finance. Oh, Simon, that, uh, that first transaction on the 31st of March was the culmination of at least two years worth of work uh, and doubtless several more before the ECCB reached the decision to go ahead. Did you or the, uh, the central bank ever experience doubt that you would get there in the end? It's a good question. I think any projects that are sort of that span multiple years uh, always, you know, feel quite burdensome you know, throughout the, the, you know, the, the time period. Um, I think I think the answer is no, though. There's a, there was a clear mission here from the get go that the governor had set, and certainly a, a lot of goals that the Eastern Caribbean Currency Union are looking to achieve more broadly with their uh, payment systems, the evolution of their payment systems. So we all knew what we were getting into. And certainly there were things that came up along the way and challenges, as you could imagine. Um, but no, no doubts that we, would bring it, uh, that we would bring it to market. This is uh, a payment system that's needed in the, in the region. And um, of course, we uh, were there to see it through. Well, in, in retrospect, and you, you've just said that the ECCB was very clear what it, that it wanted to, to get this done. But in retrospect, it was still a very bold decision uh, by the central bank back in March 2019. What do you think it was that made the ECCB the first to take this plunge into a retail uh, CBDC? Uh, I think that there's a number of uh, there's a number of sort of forcing functions. Uh, that's how I would consider it that um, that the ECCB uh, were considering in this move. Um, I can I guess I, I'll run through a number of them. The use of checks in the region is actually still uh, um, sort of it's it's quite common. It's a it's and it's obviously not the best means of payment. So one of their five year goals was to decrease the use of checks. Now, because the institutions don't have uh, sort of a common payment network where individuals can transact across institutions with one another, um, that was another uh, sort of forcing function for for rolling out a a common network where no matter what financial institution you bank with as an individual, you can transact with other individuals either from other financial institutions or not even if you don't have a bank. So that, that was also, and that leads me to sort of the, the third uh, point, which is providing financial services for citizens of the currency union uh, who do not have access to bank accounts. Um, this model enables the connection of, uh, of citizens from different banks, as well as including sort of financial inclusion efforts um, for individuals who have not had access to, uh, to bank accounts. So um, I would say, yeah, those are sort of the three main ones. There's also other uh, elements of more participation in the economy generally using digital financial services. So this is also an element of financial inclusion. If you can give people more powerful digital financial services, they're more likely to participate in the economy. And as they participate in the economy, they can increase their standard of living. So there's certainly an, an element of social good to it as well. Um, as far as moving uh, as soon as they did, I, I, I think that uh, Governor Antoine sort of ha has a, he's got a really in, well-informed perspective of technology. And he, I think he saw the trends that were happening on the digital currency side, on crypto side, stable coins and whatnot fairly early. And I think he recognized like a lot of us that this is sort of the inevitable future of, of the financial system and it's only really a question of time. So it makes sense to, uh, to get going on, on, on your research and development efforts and, and then uh, you know, determine what use cases you can serve. And, and in his case, and in the Eastern Caribbean Currency Union's case, there are plenty of use cases um, to serve that would better uh, the economy and better the, the citizens. So. Yeah, quite a few different considerations. 
Now, this is a retail CBDC. That implies it's going to be used by consumers and by merchants in day-to-day -day shopping expeditions. Uh, it's going to be used by government entities. It's going to be used by private companies to, to pay their employees. So can you explain to us a little bit about how this currency is actually going to be manufactured, minted, uh, and, and how it's going to find its way, how it's going to be distributed into the, the digital wallets of consumers and companies? Sure. Uh, there's a number of ways that it will be uh, distributed. One of the ways is, is kind of on, de on a demand basis. So uh, what's happening is the financial institutions, and there are uh, quite a few, I think there's upwards of 18 financial institutions now that are uh, integrated into the, uh, the Dcash network. And uh, so how that interaction works is the institutions are able to request newly minted digital currency from the central bank. And you can they sort of have a new asset to manage on their balance sheet now, which is also driven by the demand from the consumers. So consumers have the ability to, uh, to convert their deposits to CBDC and, uh, and also cash for, for that matter, they can convert that to CBDC. So uh, the financial institutions now have um, yeah, another another sort of currency to manage on their balance sheet that uh, that they can then pass on to uh, uh, to their clients and exchange it for deposits or cash. Um, as far as uh, non-banked individuals, um, they can acquire the currency through peer-to-peer -peer transactions, merchant transactions, receiving it through payroll. Um, there's also some benefits payments that are planned in the future for this. Uh, we are working on getting the payment system rolled out in St. Vincent. It's unfortunate that St. Vincent wasn't part of the initial four countries to get it. So the initial four countries to get it were Antigua, Barbuda, St. Kitts and Nevis, St. Lucia, and Grenada. And we're now working trying to expedite uh, St. Vincent, given the volcano that's, uh, that's happened there over the last couple of weeks. Uh, so sort of, you know, receiving payments, whether it's benefits payments or, uh, or other sorts of um, distributions is, is another way that you can obtain the, the currency. And how are the consumers going to be onboarded? And, and by that, I mean, you couldn't just walk into a bank with a, with a pile of Eastern Caribbean dollars and say, hi, I'm Dominic Cobson. Could you please put this into the app on my telephone? You need to affirm the identity that I am who I am. So yeah, and how's that going to work? Are we using digital identities of some sort here or, or some other enrollment process? Yeah, it's a good question. So it's divided into uh, two categories again. There's the banked individuals and the, and the non-unbanked uh, individuals. And they both use similar versions of the app, except one is called a value-based app and one is called uh, a registered-based uh, app. And so if you are already a banking client, then you can authenticate your application um, by declaring which institution you're associated with. And if you are not, uh, if you're not banked, then you, you enroll through what we call an agent. And an agent is responsible for verifying KYC upon sign up to the app. And this is all done in a remote way. So you're able to download the app and submit your KYC, submit your identity, and, uh, and then you can have your transaction, uh, you have your transaction capability. Um, so, and you can remember that, uh, you know, merchants and individuals can also sort of act as, uh, as teller points. And you're right, it's, it's a risk to be carrying around so much cash and it's unlikely that, uh, uh, that individuals will, will take, you know, a ton of cash to, to cash you in and out of the system. But when we think about it practically, um, these interactions are sort of boiled down to, you know, uh, being in person and saying, okay, I, you know, I have a hundred dollars, uh, cash and do you have a balance on your wall that you could send to me and say, yeah, okay, okay, well, here's a hundred dollars cash and you can send this to me. So we see it as very fluid between the digital currency and the physical currency. And it's not necessarily an effort to move the, uh, the physical currency either. Um, as I mentioned before, it's mainly an effort, uh, it's, it's, or rather the instrument that they're attempting to remove by introduction of Dcash is more so checks or reduce the usage of checks just because it's cumbersome and systems are outdated. Uh, whereas they do see an important role and most central banks do see an important role for cash well into the future. And, uh, and certainly, you know, I, th I think, especially this year, we've seen uh, across the world, uh, an increase in individuals holding cash balances, um, which of course you can track through your M1 supply. So it's a, uh, uh, or sorry, through your, through your notes and coin supply. So it, yeah, that's sort of a, a long answer of, uh, you know, how the digital currency will interact with physical currency and also how different individuals can obtain Dcash.
Is one of the benefits of this likely to be that people will acquire a digital identity they can then use in other circumstances. The, the fact they get enrolled uh, into this ecosystem uh, means they've proved their identity. So can they use that, I don't know, to claim government benefits or get a passport or a driver's license? Or is that part of the thought process at all? I could imagine that it will evolve into that. I, I do think there, like, there are some really interesting government initiatives uh, that are ongoing right now. In fact, um, one of one of them is in Antigua and Barbuda. The Social Security Board is actually the largest registered uh, merchant, and they're going to be dispersing benefits payments via Dcash. Whether it turns into an identity is, uh, I guess, is another question. I, I certainly think that integration with digital identity solutions is, is a likely outcome. Um, but but it's it hasn't been part of the pilot project uh, just yet. As you can imagine, it was a massive pilot project just to get all of the software products out there that enable the different stakeholders to uh, to interact with the Dcash network and and, and transact on using Dcash. And so I, I there were you know so many different features that were considered, um, but of course feature requests, you know, it's like any software project, feature requests at the last, uh, you know, always come up uh, and you have to prioritize which ones you're going to add in before you go live. And so here's, you know, that's where we are. Now, now uh, on the on the launch day itself, back on the 31st of March, there, there was a sort of three word mantra, which was that this is going to be safer, it's going to be faster, it's going to be uh, cheaper. And as you pointed out, getting rid of checks and physical cash, that means it's going to be going to be safer, it's going to be faster, it'll be three seconds. Um, I'm not sure how it's going to be cheaper, but I, I, I kind of assume it is. But are there other benefits to consumers beyond it being safer, faster and cheaper? Uh, yeah, look, I, I, <clears throat> I think um, being, being a, a cost effective way to transact is actually it's a it's a it impacts or rather it has a, a, a huge impact in that region. Um, where, you know, in, in some cases, merchants will choose not to uh, accept credit card payments because the few percent that it costs is too high of an impact on their business. So I wouldn't underestimate the low cost element as far as how much of an impact it will have. Um, so, so certainly, uh, you know, we expect the low cost nature of the payment system to enable increased uh, commercial activity and, and economic activity. Uh, that being said, one use case does stick out and that's uh, sort of inter-country transfers. So the ability for uh, people to now transact across you know, four different countries in the Eastern Caribbean Currency Union at very low cost. Again, this is something that uh, is, is definitely new to the region um, that could, again, enable more economic activity and, and, and more financial activity amongst the islands, which is, is certainly our goal and the goal of the Eastern Caribbean Central Bank. So I would say that's a, that's a large use case that we're looking forward to uh, seeing fulfilled and, and, and an added benefit for, uh, for the users. You mentioned this a, a couple of times, the, the wider economic benefits of a, of a digitized economy. Can you be a bit more specific about that? This You've, you've, you've given an example of uh, merchants being unwilling to accept credit card payments because it erodes their, their margin to such an extent that it makes the transaction uneconomic. What are the expectations then of the central bank about what the impact of this is going to have on, on the economy? There are going to be more transactions, the economy is going to start growing. By what process is that actually going to, to happen? Just because the, the money flow accelerates, is that enough to have that impact? Yeah, obviously, monetary velocity plays a huge role in, uh, in in economic growth, and so yeah, we are. You know, you can consider that we're we're laying the payment rails uh, for for a future uh, of the currency union where uh, money can flow, you know, more seamlessly with less friction, and uh, and certainly again cost effective and and to be a, a very very cheap method of payment. So. The, you know, the, while the use cases, you know, we could sit here and talk about use cases for, uh, you know, for hours, I, I think that it's, it's clear that um, the governor has a vision for the, the residents and citizens of the ECCU to participate more, not only economically, as, as far as, you know, different businesses are concerned and, and the, the major industries throughout the currency union, uh, but also to get more involved in, 
in investment and, and ownership of domestic and local companies. So there are there is sort of a future vision there to have this currency integrated into local stock exchanges and to encourage you know, uh, the, the citizens of the region to reinvest in their own um, in their own uh, companies and infrastructure and, and so on and so forth. So that's I, I guess that's a longer term uh, vision, Dominic, that we're laying the rails for now is to encourage um, that local investment uh, uh, ecosystem. Um, I, I think that I also just I also think that remittance payments will be a, a large uh, will could could be heavily impacted here, uh, where you just have a, a again a, a more seamless rail to to receive uh, remittance payments. So certainly one of the benefits of central bank digital currencies is reducing the cost of cross currency exchange and. Um, Get, so I guess what we're looking for are integration opportunities with remitting currencies. So obviously the U.S. dollar is a, is a big one, but also um, the, the pound and euro. Uh, so we would be looking to integrate with those CBDC networks as they come online, which will likely be within the next four years or so. I think we saw the ECB come out and say recently that uh, they expect uh, within the next four years to, to have a digital euro. Um, I can imagine that the Fed is probably on a similar timeline. They, they haven't stated that, that uh, there's urgency, but yet they are uh, obviously investigating and, and doing research on their own end. So um, some of those benefits will come down the line. And the fact that the ECCU is prepared with a you know, fully functional, uh, well-trafficked uh, digital currency system, um, they will be able to integrate with these uh, CBDC networks as they come online, as well as stablecoin networks. You know, in, in advance of that, there's plenty of stablecoin networks out there now uh, that are seeing a lot of traffic, a lot of transaction activity. And so, to the extent that uh, the central bank wishes to integrate with those, those are, you know, that's another big use case uh, of remittance that we're looking to fulfill and, and cut costs there for the recipients and the, and the senders, for that matter. Uh, of course, the Eastern Caribbean is itself a, a, a currency union, so this is already a, a multinational uh, a CBDC. You've just alluded to um, how this is going to make it much easier for cross-border payments to be made, particularly remittances, which are important to this uh, to this region. But until that happens, uh, the CBDC will interact in the normal way with through the correspondent banking system with with other currencies. Is that how it will work for for cross-currency transactions? until, I don't know, the European Central Bank or the Bank of England or the Federal Reserve has a CBDC? Um, yeah, I guess, there, yeah, there's, uh, until there's other currency networks for it to integrate with directly, of, of course, that it will have to rely on, on uh, you know, the existing legacy financial infrastructure for transactions that take place outside of that currency. But it is like the network itself is accessible in, each island and, and sort of treat it as one common network, similar to how the internet is accessible in, in each island and treated as one common network. So um, while the individuals who reside in different islands, different countries uh, need to uh, sign up for you know, their wallets in uh, w with either the financial institution or agents that service that particular island and are responsible for you know, collecting and, and verifying uh, KYC, um, they're still able to transact with uh, with all other wallet holders ac ac across the region, across the currency union. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's yeah, I guess I, I hope that answered your question. I, I think that the yeah the the cross currency stuff is really exciting, but it's uh, um, it, we we need those networks to be built in order to achieve the those seamless integrations that I was talking about. In the long run, you think correspondent banks might be replaced by some other kind of organization. Once CBDCs become as a global uh, phenomenon, or not? Not necessarily. I look. I think that banks play an important role in the ecosystem. Of course, uh, I think that's undeniable. And so, uh, you know, maybe the the recent OCC letter from uh, uh, Brian Brooks in uh, January, um, which uh, effectively paved the way for American commercial banks to custody mm -hmm. transact in stable coins on what they called. Uh, independent node verification networks, which is just another term for decentralized uh, networks like Ethereum or Bitcoin. Um, that's a step in the, in the direction of just enabling banks to, uh, to transact using uh, stable coins, which are the closest to, uh, you know, to, to, a, to a CBDC that we've seen for the US dollar so far, just given that they are transacting on what I refer to as an internet native payment rail. 
So a payment rail that doesn't rely on legacy infrastructure at all and, and settles in a purely online environment. Um, and again, it's somewhat contradictory because obviously the current uh, version of stable coins have one-to-one -one backing. And so um, they, they're backed by, you know, reserve, reserve accounts held with financial institutions. And yet the participants, like people transacting in stable coins, um, a, a lot of them treat them as though they are a purely uh, sort of uh, internet native um, asset. Uh, and that means that they, they treat them as a, as a, as a uh, sort of a store of value and a means of exchange, they they're not always seeking to settle back to uh, central bank money, um, like you would like you see in other parts of the system. Um, so again, that's sort of a, a long way of saying that I, I think the financial institutions have a role uh, certainly in, in processing payments and uh, on networks of all types. So you'll see them, you know, and I think uh, actually in, in Germany as well, I think the Germans uh, cleared the way for commercial banks to um, offer you know, payment services in, uh, in, in crypto and, and stable coins uh, or much earlier than the, this OCC letter came out. This was just January. And I think the, I think the Germans did it um, almost a year earlier. In fact, I remember hearing about that at the start of 2020. So, uh, yeah, I, I, I do think that uh, the financial institutions will play a key role, although there, there is an, an opportunity for these networks to be connected directly, which more so cuts out uh, exchanges um, where you may not need the same foreign exchange um, uh, functions, at least for some use cases. C certainly as you have bigger movements of foreign exchange, of course, you will probably continue to require the traditional infrastructure and um, systems like the CLS uh, and whatnot are obviously um, systemically important, uh, but I wouldn't be surprised if the connections between CBDC networks sort of mimic some of the CLS functions and, uh, and, and offer, you know, some of these remittance use cases and, uh, and other sort of trade finance use cases um, that have been researched as being sort of big opportunities for CBDCs. I'm interested that you kind of bracket the CBDC with, with the cryptocurrency world put them in the same bucket, if you like. I mean, I asked you that question partly because I, the Bank of England just this week uh, furthered its program of gradually opening up its real-time gross settlement system to, to non-banks. It's allowed them to operate these omnibus or, or, or commingled accounts. That struck me as a very significant uh, development if we're moving to, towards, um, you know, fiat currency is, is, is already available in, in digital form, but here we're once it becomes a central bank digital currency, it's just like, as, you, as you've been saying, um, a cryptocurrency with all the advantages that that, 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 that brings. These worlds are, are obviously converging. And I wonder if you, I wonder if you feel what the, the European, uh, sorry, the, the, the Eastern Caribbean Central Bank has done uh, has tilted the balance somewhat towards CBDCs that are going to be Retail. We, we've had this discussion retail versus wholesale for some time now. Do you think that this yeah. indicates that almost all CBDC projects going to end up in a pretty similar place to the ECCB? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and look, I should clarify that I think the the reason why that you'll hear me talk about um, crypto and CBDCs in the same bucket is 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 mainly just because they are what I refer to as. Uh, uh, internet native payment rails. So they're, they're payment rails that exist purely in an online environment um, and, and they don't rely on legacy infrastructure to settle. So when you transact in the CBDC, the, tr the transaction is the settlement. Now, obviously CBDC is backed you know, by a central bank authority, uh, and whereas uh, crypto is, is sort of backed by uh, you know, new concepts that uh, you know, seem to be catching on, but it's a completely different kettle of fish when you talk about uh, the value that's backing them or, or the value proposition that they bring. And so the, what, what is similar is, is mainly the underpinnings uh, of, the, of the technology um, where it's a, a, a unit of account that transacts in a purely online environment. Um, so just to clarify that, uh, the, the wholesale versus retail, um, I think the, the wholesale discussion, I think it became somewhat, uh, I think it's apparent that wholesale uh, CBDCs are more so represent a technology upgrade to RTGS networks, um, which are already in existence. And, uh, and not to say that there's not um, 
innovation that can be realized there. I just think that the the general purpose CBDCs uh, or, or retail um, probably offer, I mean, there's certainly a larger step in, in the sense of uh, both policy and technology. So it's like a technology upgrade for a payment system as well as being um, the evolution of policy. So a big step in, in, uh, in, in monetary policy. Uh, so I think that's why they are getting more and more, um, I guess, you know, news coverage or, uh, or interest or um, yeah, I guess that, that's why more people are interested in uh, in, in the in the retail level CBDCs because they reflect a, a more dramatic change and a much larger evolution in uh, in the mechanics of uh, of our monetary system. So whether or not uh, look, I, I think the ECCB is certainly an interesting model for uh, currency unions, and it shows yeah how uh, how a retail CBDC can can function well in in this sort of economy. So certainly I, there will be lessons learned. That apply to uh, to central banks, and and I'm you know I'm I'm very much looking forward to uh, to seeing how it evolves, and and you know being part of it, of addressing the challenges that come up and the opportunities that come up. But um, yeah, I think any retail CBDC project that's going on right now uh, is is going to be a wealth of knowledge for all the other central banks that are uh, looking to do the same thing in in the sort of short or medium term. You just referred to, to lessons learned. Now, Governor Antoine said on the day that we have learned many transferable lessons along the way. Um, uh, now, I wonder what those transferable lessons are. What, what are the lessons of Dcash for other central banks? And are those lessons specific to emerging market economies or are they applicable also to developed markets? Can any central bank learn from this project or is, is it more focused on, as you just mentioned, currency unions or emerging market economies? Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, yeah, I, look, I think one of the one of the biggest lessons um, that uh, that could be taken just generally for for CBDC projects is while the focus is uh, is a lot on technology, the development of the technology, making sure that the uh, technology solution meets the requirements of the central bank and of financial institutions, and of course of the the enterprises and retail users in the region. Um, it's, it's not just a technology project. It's a, like you're, a, you're taking a huge software solution to market and there's all kinds of different considerations when you're doing that. And, uh, and of course, you know, we've seen uh, plenty of applications come to market. Uh, I, mean, I mean, probably hundreds of thousands, right? Of applications come to market uh, since the app store became a, <laughs> you know, a sort of a household um, a household item over the past, I guess it's gotta be what, 10, 10 or 15 years now that apps have been such a, uh, you know, this massive trend in terms of um, how people interact with the internet and transfer information and connect with each other over the internet. So launching a CBDC and all of these associated applications and onboarding all of the participants the stakeholders in the in the financial ecosystem it's a huge exercise and it's much more than just a technology project i think the you know the next most obvious bit for for central bankers and, and financial institutions is the policy bit which of course and the legal bit which is extremely important as well um, but how about go to market strategy and marketing and user acquisition and customer support and these sorts of things these these require pretty large efforts of organizational change management and the establishment of new policies and procedures and in some cases, new departments, uh, certainly new you know, governance processes to manage and, uh, and, uh, and yeah, all kinds of different sort of organizational change. So I would just say, you know, the uh, doing an impact assessment of how the rollout of a, of a central bank digital currency will affect each stakeholder that it touches. I mean, it's a huge, it's just such a huge project. So uh, that, that would be the biggest lesson learned is, is that is to sort of recognize early on in the, in the project that uh, it's much more than just technology and having uh, an understanding of all the requirements for going to market and making it a success is, uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a huge effort. Mm -hmm. Well, talking of going to market, this is a, um you know, still a pilot program, albeit one with, you know, live ammunition. Um, what is the, the timetable that 
that's been set for the incorporation of Dcash into the lives, day-to-day -day lives of people and businesses in these in these eight countries and the complete abolition of the of the previous system, by which I mean, among other things, getting rid of of uh, of physical cash, you know, actually re replace the dollars. What's the what's the timetable and what are the things that need to be done? To complete the project. Yeah, I should say again. Yeah, the, the central bank isn't looking to replace cash. I think they're, they're trying to give people a, a, a better options generally. So there, it's not like there's a move to remove cash entirely. There's certainly, as I mentioned before, there's certainly a remove to reduce the usage of checks. Uh, again, because they're just cumbersome and, uh, and costly and, you know, sort of high latency. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I guess there's already quite a few merchants onboarding and, and plenty of merchants had onboarded before the official date. Again, we had been, we had been training the financial institutions and the merchants, um, like hundreds of merchants prior to that March 31st launch date to ensure that, you know, when we go live, it's not just like, okay, the application's there, you can mm -hmm. put, download it and use it. It's, you know, before the, the, the bit team. And I have to give a shout out to the bit team members who were involved in, in um, training the financial institutions and the, and the merchants on, on the software and making sure that, you know, come launch date, this thing can actually be used by mobile wallet users to go spend. And so we're seeing an increase in, in uh, transactions uh, or rather the central bank is seeing an increase in, in the transactions. And um, yeah, I think it's, it's, it'll be a case of uh, just like any other sort of application that gets rolled out. It, there, uh, there will be sort of network effects that lead to adoption and uh, an increase in use cases that lead to increase in transaction volumes. And uh, so uh, I guess the, the use cases that I personally think will sort of play a large role in its success will be uh, using CBDC for payroll, uh, which again, very straightforward payroll, payroll process for, uh, for paying uh, employees direct to their mobile wallet, using it for benefits payments and relief payments. So you know, before we were thinking about COVID relief payments and now we're looking at these relief payments for the citizens of St. Vincent who've been impacted by the volcano. Uh, so there's all kinds of different use cases that could result in uh, increased usage. Uh, as far as considering the project a success, um, the other four countries in the Eastern Caribbean Currency Union will be onboarded sort of like within the next year or so. And uh, at that point, we're, go we're going to see even more network effects because there will be more individuals who are connected via a common monetary network. Um, so again, we're looking for that to increase the, uh, the regional uh, trade and just transactions, you know, uh, across islands. Um, but again, yeah, not, not looking for the abolishment of the, of the uh, physical dollar by any stretch. Um, just, just looking to introduce, uh, you know, powerful digital payment system for the region that can uh, enable more transaction activity at a, at a lower cost. Uh, you, you referred to, to employers using this system to, to, to pay their staff. Now the staff are going to have digital wallets, not, not bank accounts. Is, is the same true of, of the employers as well? And I, I ask you that question because I'm, I'm wondering whether banks fit into this, into this changed and changing um, ecosystem. You know, you often run into people who say, well, of course the Eastern Caribbean could do this because they don't have any banks and nobody has a bank account. But that's not true, is it? There, I mean, there are banks and people do have bank accounts. They're running checks on them. So where do the banks fit into this system now and in the future? Mm -hmm. So the banks will be providing applications uh, to their end users as well. So for the duration of the pilot project, BIT is acting as the technology service provider for all of the institutions. So we're providing those wallets to all the institutions. Um, but what's expected is following the pilot uh, phase, uh, the, the Dcash network will open up so that uh, other licensed entities can provide their own wallets. Um, and, th and this will obviously include the, the banks that are already licensed to connect to the network. So at that point, they can switch to using uh, their own wallets with their own business models um, and then it becomes more of a competitive lands landscape for competing for different types of payments and different feature sets. So this is where the increased competition element of CBDCs comes into play. Um, it's meant to be uh, not, not a fully open network, but a permissioned network where licensed payment service providers and financial institutions can build value add payment services on top of the network. 
So that's, that's where I see the role of, of the banks as far as payments are concerned. Um, obviously, banks are still you know, critical for uh, credit. Um, and and uh, that's, that's obviously going to continue. Uh, um, administering credit through mobile wallets is obviously an opportunity. And I think that the, uh, the ability for financial institutions to um, sort of give uh, up-to-date uh, credit risk ratings and whatnot by uh, using their own uh, consumer data for the purpose of uh, providing credit I think that's a big opportunity for commercial as well. I mean, obviously it, it does, uh, it, and this is sort of stated in many of the papers that the risk of migrating from deposits to CBDCs is probably the biggest threat to, uh, to commercial yeah, banks. Well, and, and of course yeah. that's a risk. Yeah, yeah. So of course that's a, that's a risk. I think that there's a number of ways that the regulators considered dealing with that risk. I've read a number of papers on um, how, for example, the central bank will consider CBDCs that are stored with uh, financial institution clients and how they could be considered on their balance sheet to still contribute to uh, their own reserves uh, in proportion to the amount of credit that they're able to give out in the fractional reserve system. So, and that's just one way. There, there are a number of different ways that I think policy could evolve to accommodate for commercial banks so that it's not just... Uh, providing, you know, the rails for a digital bank run, because that's certainly not the intent, or at least, uh, you know, from my, from my view, I don't think that's the intent uh, and, and, and not the intent to destabilize the financial system. I think that there's a lot more thought that has gone into this, um, uh, that it's not, you know, it's destabilizing the financial system doesn't serve anyone. So I think there are a number of different sort of um, levers that can be pulled to accommodate for this new financial instrument. And then specific to the region, the Eastern Caribbean, uh, a, a lot of the banks have pulled out over the last, uh, I guess, decade, you could say. Um, a lot of the Canadian banks were down there and they've pulled out of the region over the last while. So it's so there aren't as you know extensive banking services as you would expect, like I would expect up here in Canada or you might expect in the UK. Um, so it is, you know, it, it, it's, a, it's a region that's sort of, uh, in, in need of, um, of sort of upgraded digital financial services. So um, yeah, but, but you're right. It's a, I mean, it's, it's, it's cutting edge. So it's, it's something that, you know, I don't have all the answers for, and nobody really does, um, but we can see the different variables at play and, uh, and manage those variables as, as best we can. And, and, and the central bank will do the same, of course. As you say, in order to offer credit, banks need funding in the, in the shape of deposits. This, this currency has only been running for a little over three weeks, so it's, I guess it's too soon to say you're seeing any shift in deposits from banks to other entities. Yeah, and I, I wouldn't have access to that data myself. Um, we're, we're kept in the, in the loop on, uh, on sort of, you know, merchant transaction activity and some of the wallet transaction activity, but not, uh, yeah, we, we don't have access to all the data, as you can imagine. <laughs> yeah. Now, you, you referred to to apps um, and those apps, you're starting to see those becoming available now so that the Dcash is an infrastructure and anybody who has a, a good idea for an app can make that available in the usual shops and kind of build, um, I don't know, things like monitoring your, 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 your transactions, um, your bank balance and so on. Those sort of apps are being developed already and, and made available already in anticipation of Dcash becoming more popular? Uh, no, not just yet. Yeah, for the, so for the duration of the pilot, it will be uh, Bits uh, Mobile Wallet and our merchant solution, you know, our e-commerce plugin uh, and, and whatnot. And so, uh, as I said, after the pilot phase, uh, the network will open up where licensed institutions will be able to build apps uh, on top of the network and, and provide different uh, or, you know, integrate payment services into existing applications. Like, um, yeah, and I wouldn't be surprised to, to see that there are existing mobile payment solutions in the, in the Eastern Caribbean currency union um, that have already, you know, been in contact to integrate as soon as possible. So definitely excited to include some of those local players um, and, uh, and excited to see some of the business models that, that they will come up with. Uh, you know, I see, I think payments could go a number of different ways, but I, I wouldn't be surprised if we see, 
different social platforms incorporating payments functionality into their applications or you know other existing applications uh, just incorporating payments functionality getting the requisite licensing or partnering with a financial institution um, to provide that payments element and then incorporating uh, payment services into the existing services so yeah that, that's sort of my personal guess now at the at the launch event governor antoine made what i thought was a very interesting observation and he emphasized it that he sees the payment system as a as a public good and at one level i i fully understand what he means you know if if in any country the payment system fell over you'd soon have uh, anarchy and and um uh, riots in the streets but i sensed he meant, meant something more than that and of course cbdc is something bigger than simply an infrastructure which facilitates payments between bank accounts isn't it can a can a CBD, can a CBDC bear the weight of which he ascribed to it of, of being a, a public good? I'd like to think so. Uh, and I know that he genuinely has that vision for the, the, you know, the payment system in the region. It, it's going to require a number of things. Obviously, I, I had written an article about a year ago that described sort of financial inclusion as being boiled down to cost and access. So what are the factors in accessing the system? Do you require a smartphone or a tablet? Do you just require access to a smartphone or tablet or a computer for that matter uh, in order to be able to transact? And, uh, and, and how easy is it for the general population to obtain those devices? So access is certainly a, a big one. Um, and, and that access is a little trickier to, uh, uh, to, to address, at least from a central bank perspective. Um, and I believe they've done a good job by opening up to obviously not just financial institutions, but also agents so that non-bank or non-banked individuals can, can get access to the network. But again, taking it back, you know, one step further, it's okay. How do we ensure that citizens have just the devices required and internet capability to access the system? So that's sort of a, that's a difficult challenge. And, and yet smartphone use in the region is, is definitely high. And uh, I think that can be attributed to the fact that, um, you know, in the first world, many people are buying new versions of smartphones all the time. So the older versions uh, trickle down and get sold on secondary markets and the prices are much lower to the point where, you know, have a, you have a super powerful smartphone from a few years ago um, that you can pick up relatively cheap. And, uh, and, and so I think that solves some elements of, of the access, at least at the hardware level. Um, the, on the cost side of things, uh, again, for the duration of the pilot, the, the, the Eastern Caribbean Central Bank is, is going to maintain zero cost for people using the network. And uh, what, what I'm curious to see is moving forward what they will choose to do, because in some cases we've seen, uh, like you can, you can put in legislation that would mandate a zero cost uh, payment system, at least for some payment scenarios. So for peer-to-peer -peer payments, for example, wallet-to-wallet -wallet payments, it's possible that you could legislate and say no transaction fees on peer-to-peer -peer payments, or you can cap transaction fees maybe, or you can cap transaction fees on commercial transactions. So these are all sort of configurable um, within any payment system and, and definitely within the Dcash uh, network. So I'm, I'm very curious to see how the legislation pans out with respect to um, uh, transaction fees. Cause I think that also sort of feeds back to the public good element. It's like, mm -hmm. if, if these networks in one way or another are publicly funded, um, how is that value then you know, given back to, uh, to, to the citizens and the businesses of, uh, of the region? And one of the ways would obviously be keeping costs as low as possible and then enabling the, you know, the payment service providers to compete um, for market share and, and by providing valuable services to the end users. Um, oh, I hope I answered your question. I know that th those yeah. are the considerations that I have anyway, but I hope I answered your question. Yeah, we, we would all be very interested to, to see how, how it unfolds uh, along the lines you, you just outlined. So I hope you'll, you'll keep us informed. One a final question for you, uh, Simon. When I asked you about what the lessons were for other central banks, you, you spoke much less about the technology, much more about, if you like, the project management, about the governance of it, about the marketing of it, about actually making this thing happen. Now, this you made it happen. This is quite a coup for, for BIT. You've made a little piece of, of history here. In fact, you're also the chief business development officer. Um, are the world's central banks now beating a pass to your door? Uh, yeah, look, just, yeah, we're in touch with, with quite a few central banks. And so they're very interested to see uh, 
how what's going on here and how we can help their institution. And so obviously very keen to uh, uh, to help these central banks. The um, uh, I guess on the technology front, um, BIT is working with the likes of the ITU and Stanford's uh, Central Bank Digital Currency Standards Working Group. And I think these are really important initiatives to uh, for central banks to consider and just include, yeah, what technology standards um, should be uh, should be considered when you're piloting and testing and developing and deploying a, a CBDC software solution. Um, I'm, I'm actually on the Digital Currency Governance Consortium for the World Economic Forum now, which is also preparing uh, design guidelines for CBDCs. So the different considerations for, uh, and, and not just you know down to uh, what transaction network you should use because there's a lot of great contenders right now, both blockchain based and non-blockchain based or distributed and non, um, but also the considerations for governance of these networks and how to structure the uh, relationship with technology service providers like BIT. Uh, there's many different considerations as far as um, developing technology that will meet this current standards and also sort of future proof um, to, to handle the transaction activity that we think these networks will, uh, will likely experience in, in the future. So, uh, so technology standards are absolutely key. And uh, yeah, we're, we're definitely excited to be experienced like an influx of interest from central banks and financial institutions for that matter. I mean, uh, BIT has uh, solutions for financial institutions as well to be able to plug into these networks, whether they're plugging into central bank digital currency networks or stablecoin networks, or again, crypto networks. Uh, we, we see financial institutions are increasingly interested in what BIT has to offer. Um, both for their own institutions, looking to transact, you know, between their institution and other institutions or between their institution and merchants and retail clients, but then also equipping their merchant and retail clients with, uh, with our mobile wallet application and our merchant applications. So there's interest, yeah, there, there's interest from all over, I guess you could say, Dominic. Simon Sharpie, thanks very much. Um,